Um, I have the unenviable uh, position of being between uh, you and drinks. Um, but a bit enviable position because I get to say everybody who said everything beforehand was wrong, here's what I think, and then I get to drop the mic and, and leave. No. Um, that's not true. Um, and by the way, the closer you sit to the front, the more likely you are to get uh, one of these goodies. Um, so I'm, it's my gentle nudge. I learned a few things from the nudge, the nudge uh, behavioral insights crowd. Um, so, I really love frameworks. We've been hearing about a lot of them. Unfortunately, I'm gonna show you one more, sorry. Um, what I heard a lot over the past two days is a lot about uh, outcomes, a lot about sense-making, um, navigating through changes, being purpose-driven, being ethical, um, some really great tools and methods to, to do that. Um, and I'm going to share one that we've uh, started to use in the public sector in my work. Um, and uh, I do want you to challenge it um, because this is, uh, this is how uh, things get better. In fact, uh, I don't know how many other people are from public sector at this conference, but I really appreciate the opportunity to learn from you uh, because that tests my thinking. Sometimes we spend too long in our own bubbles uh, and kind of get caught up in um, drinking from our communal uh, well. There we go. Um, so my background is in ecosystem science, uh, which gave me an appreciation for things that are nonlinear, ambiguous, disconnected, uh, difficult to predict cause and effect, uh, which prepared me really well for working with humans <laughs> um, in the public sector. Um, this was me. I was an uh, applied uh, ecosystem scientist. I was an urban forester of a municipality in the United States. This is the coolest job I think I ever had and will have. So everything I do from now is just icing on the cake because I got to hang around in trees all day, get these majestic photos taken of me. I had a badge and that badge said number one. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't get more rock star than that in terms of public sector work. Um, so ever since uh, 2017, I've been at the OECD. Um, and how many of you know OECD? Okay, so about half of you. So we love our acronyms. So you've heard a couple, you know, one already, Observatory of Public Sector Innovation, which is my group at the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. It was started after uh, World War II as part of the Marshall Plan um, to uh, kind of rebuild Europe and has since evolved into largely an economics-focused uh, policy shop, but there are also directorates that have to do with anything multiple governments might care about. So agriculture, health, um, you name it. So my group, uh, and by the way, these are all the OECD uh, member nations. So we work um, primarily at the uh, uh, at the national level, although innovation work does happen at other levels and we, we also um, look to that for examples. So if you've ever seen a chart like this comparing GDP or uh, income inequality, the, the OECD probably um, uh, provided that data and maybe even made the chart. So that's the, most of the, the kind of bread and butter of the OECD, um, but uh, our work is a little different. Um, so, I really care about the public sector, and I'm going to be a little bit irreverent maybe at parts of this uh, talk, um, kind of just to poke back at, at, uh, at you who are largely working in um, private sector, because I know the reputation government has. But I really care about government. I really care that it serves the purposes that we want it to serve, um, because I, I want to do a little experiment with you. I want you to, I know it's the end of the day, this is dangerous, um, I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes and imagine the most horrendous government administration in the world. Um, now imagine some activity that they do. So now imagine 
if efficiency is the only metric because we want our governments to be efficient, imagine that government doing that thing 200% more efficiently. That's why I care about government. <laughs> Uh, a lot of public administrations are suffering, you can open your eyes again, uh, are suffering from this kind of new public management paradigm where it's, uh, you know, how can government function more like business and be more efficient, uh, very efficiency driven. And I'm here to talk about uh, some of the other purposes and values uh, that guide government's work and why they're important, um, as you may have just told yourself. Um, so. I work in the Observatory of Public Sector Innovation. Uh, we're a very small team, uh, ranging from uh, eight to 10, so very, very small in a very large organization of about 3,000. We like it that way. <laughs> um, so some of the things we do are we uh, uncover emerging practice and identify what's next. So what are the trends that are either shaping uh, the uh, government's work or what are the things that we will have to respond to? So the, one of the ways we do that is uh, we track uh, trends through our case study library, um, which includes over 1,000 innovations. Um, and I'll talk about what that means um, from 100 plus countries. So we're looking beyond OECD countries as well. We also work on turning the new into normal. So going from kind of emergent or novel practice into uh, good practice. I wouldn't say we work really on best practice because there are other people in the organization that work on that. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means. Um, one of the ways we do that is to socialize things like the declaration on public sector innovation, which we recently had 40 uh, nations sign on to. So these principles might not be that unfamiliar to you if you work in design, um, but sometimes it, it's, th this is what consensus looks like, and these are the kind of basic minimum principles that um, these 40 plus uh, nations agreed to. So you can hold them to them. I know we have representation from around the world, so make sure you're holding your own uh, public sector administration accountable to this declaration. The first question we got from everybody was, who signed it? What's their email address? So it's a good sign. Um, and then we provide trusted advice to governments based on what we see. Um, so it's, it's a run a bit like a consultancy. Um, so I'll talk in terms of clients because that's the language that I know a lot of you use. Um, although in our case, our clients are governments. Um, and because we're, uh, we work in this kind of innovative space, we work on uh, lines of work that don't, do not yet exist uh, in government as a standard thing. Um, and so we do a lot of our work on a demand basis, which makes us even more um, like a consultancy. Uh, and uh, because we have some flexibility, we also use our resources to poke at governments and ask them the things that they didn't ask for. <laughs> So we also develop work around, around that. So this is where I start to get a little irreverent, sorry. Um, so what is public sector innovation? We've, I don't know how many times we've, we've gone through this and had to answer this question. And actually in the public sector, it's kind of hard to answer. And I'll go into why. So novel to the context. It doesn't have to be absolutely novel, but it has to be novel to the context. So that's fine, that's actually the same, maybe in private sector. Uh, it has to be implemented. It can't be just a notion or an idea or a theory. It has to actually, ha the, the doing part has to have happened. Uh, which leads to the third. Again, this is also, you know, concepts sitting on the shelf, undeveloped patents, things like that. A type of, of innovation, but uh, you know, not the kind we're talking about here in the private sector context. And then um, third, has an impact on public value. And this is one of the main departure points for public sector, private sector innovation. So, I'm going to get into a little bit of what I mean by public values. You may also substitute with a word like outcomes. So what's the outcome of government, 
of government functioning? And is there an impact on that in a really fundamental way? So, uh, Chris, are you still in the room? I don't know, maybe I had to head out. So yesterday, uh, Chris Potts did a master class, and um, he had these kind of enterprise outcomes that he listed for, uh, for private sector. Um, and I'm going to pick on him a little bit, and that's not fair, because he's not here to defend himself. Um, so he talked about revenues, operating costs, productivity, customer delight, brand reputation, product and service innovation, employee engagement, structural performance, legal and regulatory compliance, business continuity. And talked about in terms of these are variable, they're trade-offs, you can invest in you know, um, some and not others, and really your portfolio mix ultimately is driven by these outcomes or values um, to your enterprise. Uh, I don't disagree with that. That's fine. That's a really actually useful framework for organizing everything that that enterprise does. My point is that public sector is different. So my snarky edit is that actually there are really two here. When we're thinking of absolutely at the enterprise level, at the boardroom level. So we're talking about revenues and operating costs, which is negative profit. Um, so productivity is to create revenue. Customer and delight is repeat revenue in the future. Brand reputation, repeat revenue in the future to new or the same customers. Uh, product or service innovation to deliver value to, to create revenue. Employee engagement to create revenue, lower costs um, when they stay and don't churn uh, and produce great things. Structural performance to deliver value to create revenue, like legal and regulatory compliance to lower costs, business continuity to create consistent slash future revenue. So this is my snarky edit, and it's really just to say, it, you, you have a really useful, actually this simplifies things a lot, you have a very useful uh, ultimate frame and, and guide for the work. I know that individual teams have different outcomes. So I'm not talking about the individual team, but at the enterprise level, possibly a, the B Corp or smaller organizations are a bit different. But this is a really useful guide. Will it make money? Will it help give us, you know, future? Especially when we're talking about large organizations, which is where enterprise design, you know, comes into, you know, becomes more um, useful, actually. Uh, so I try to think about the government equivalents. <laughs> per me. Uh, so there are, yeah, revenues, taxes, and service fees, I guess. That's not the main driver. Um, productivity maybe depends on what we're talking about. Um, customer delight, citizen satisfaction. Brand reputation, relevancy in citizens' lives. Uh, legal and regulatory compliance, uh, governments also have to abide by treaties and things that they've made with their peers uh, and with the OECD. Uh, Business continuity, um, legitimacy? I don't know. This, it was just a, a test, but it's to say it's, some of these are the same, but a lot of them are different because there are more <laughs> in the public sector. Um, so this is not my list. Um, this is a, a list of, uh, from people who think a lot more about this. And we still don't have it right, because deciding what these are and what these are not is in itself a moral and political conversation. So things like public interest, protection of individual rights, balance of interest, equal treatment, access to justice. These are things that also have to fit into that equation about purpose. So this is just a little bit of my job to say, in public sector, it's far more complex and far more difficult because we don't have that guiding North Star. Does it create revenue? Um, so, for example, uh, looking at even two different dimensions uh, of, of this, so uh, values at stake in a refugee policy, in a utilitarian or good uh, evaluation, uh, you would say, at the individual level, refugees feel safe, refugees are satisfied about their treatment, these, we can measure these things. Um, internal security is maintained, financial costs to government kept low, Re refugees successfully integrated into the economic, social, political system. These can still be, you know, these can be measured. Um, and we can know whether we did a good job. 
the fair and the just view, refugees feel rights conferred and obligations imposed on them are fair, just and fair in the interim processing period and afterward. Hmm. How do we measure that? <laughs> Uh, ultimate status of refugees in society is consistent with the ideas of justice and right relationships among different individuals in society. Whoa. So this is to point out the, the difference in defining that purpose and then organizing around those purposes. Because oftentimes there's a lack of clarity about them, which makes government's job really hard. And it also makes other things that are easier to point at and easier to measure uh, more prominent, especially when we hold our uh, government accountable for using our tax dollars wisely. So what are these values worth? So it's complex. Um, so my point, the stakes are high slash different, evaluation is very difficult, uh, and the purpose is more varied. And another thing, um, oftentimes even OECD talks about being this kind of objective observer, that kind of thing. There's no such thing as observer in a complex system, sorry. <laughs> you enter that space, you are interfering with that space, you're changing the dynamic of the relationship. Um, and designers have an incredible power, especially in the public sector. Uh, the, you are able to interpret someone else's story of what they want. And if the outcome of that is not that they have a delightful experience with their product, but if they get citizenship, that's, the stakes are, are really, really different. Um, so it's very important to be aware of that power um, and to treat it with, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. Um, and own your cognitive biases. We're not, nobody is perfect, nobody is objective, but awareness is a first step. So maybe the thing that makes the most sense to talk about uh, with, between government and governance, uh, or, or with these kind of enterprise concepts, is we're not talking about government, which is the way that we uh, elect our, um, um, uh, the way that people are represented in the society, but rather, how are the things that government does manage, organize, set up? So I'm gonna talk about kind of more governance. So I just introduced um, uh, the topic that's done. I'm gonna go through a little exercise. I'm gonna explain it. I'm gonna talk about innovation facets uh, in the workshop we developed uh, con in conjunction with uh, EDA, our hosts and uh, about innovation portfolios and how to shift them, uh, what we've learned so far doing this work in government. So first exercise um, is a question for the audience. So think about this. Which question drives your work? And ideally, we would, we're gonna do show of hands. Ideally, we, um, you could be somewhere in between, but you're gonna have to take a stand today. Um, so the questions are, how might we achieve X? And I'll go through the questions. How might we achieve X? That involves aligning activities inside of an organization toward a common overarching goal, generate external interest and investment in those goals, drive systemic change beyond any immediate incentives involved. How might we do X better? Cost reduction and operational efficiency, uh, increased reach of programs and services, uh, reliability and optimization of products and services. How might emerging possibilities fundamentally change what X could or should be? Uh, this is picking up on weak signals, engaging with them before a course is locked in, exploring emergent issues that might shape future priorities and future commitments, test assumptions and explore radically different possibilities with lead users. How might our evolved situation change how we do X? So develop a diverse range of, range of choices to solve for emergent challenges, enable those close to the problems or users to create solutions, um, and take advantage of newly available possibilities unknown to the enterprise. So show of hands, and I'll do ordinal directions, so north, south, east, west. Um, how many of you, uh, uh, 
how many of you would say the, f um, the north, how, how might we achieve X, is guiding your work or driving your work? Okay, maybe about a quarter to a third. Um, how about, how might we do X better? How many of that should drive a couple? A handful, okay. Uh, and then, how might our evolved situation change how we do X? Okay, again, a couple. Uh, and then, how might emerging possibilities fundamentally change what X could or should be? Okay, a few more. So, yeah, in order of who's working on what, how might we do X better, or sorry, uh, how might we achieve X had the most, how might we emerging possibilities fundamentally change what X could or should be, had the second most, and then a handful each of, of the other two questions. Interesting. So this, this, these are the key activating questions as part of our model. And the reason I ask you the questions first is that I don't just want to give you the model first. Uh, but this is kind of the plain language dimensions of the model. So this is based on our public sector innovation system studies in Brazil and Canada. Uh, and addition, in addition, uh, the experience of, of uh, my team, which we all come from uh, government backgrounds or have worked in government in addition to private sector uh, over their careers. So it has two dimensions, uh, so directed or top-down and undirected or bottom-up. So words used here are things like shaping versus responding. And then we're looking at certainty and uncertainty. Certainty being exploiting or incremental, uncertainty being exploring or radical. And then th this is kind of the, the practice that I talked about. And this is, um, you know, practices exist in every discipline. Um, as the practice evolves, this is how knowledge is created and kind of moves to the state of uh, re uh, reliable uh, repeat application. So on the certainty end, we're talking about best practice. These are the things that you can write in a manual and share easily. Um, good practice, maybe things like principles. Um, emergent practice um, are things that are just starting to become known. And then novel practice is a lot of times art and metaphor and uh, those kind of weak signals. Um, sci-fi, um, that kind of thing. So it's, we can't even say what it is yet because we haven't even, we don't even have the words to articulate it. Uh, and then the difference here when we're talking about systems and services, certain uh, the, the left side is about um, enhancing the existing system and service, and the other side is about replacing, eliminating, or subverting systems and services. For government, that's scary. Uh, so we, we put these together and we get um, this uh, model. So at the top, uh, just starting from the top in no particular order, um, we talk about mission-oriented innovation. These are things like getting to carbon neutral, plastic-free oceans, um, eliminating domestic violence. Um, these are br broad societal goals. Uh, and oftentimes it takes uh, top-down uh, directed effort, investment uh, to set that course. The classic example is, you know, putting a person on the moon, um, which forced a reorganization of an entire administration. Uh, Enhancement-oriented innovation are things in the, in the public sector of uh, using behavioral nudges to increase uh, tax payment. Um, on time tax payments, uh, creating a uh, digital version of an enrollment system for social services. These are kind of uh, uh, enhancement oriented, oriented innovation. Government is the best at this, but still doesn't do enough of it. <laughs> so uh, the, the sad part of the story is government isn't doing enough of any of these things, um, but it's doing the most of enhancement oriented innovation. It's also, uh, I'll get into why. Uh, adaptive, um, so in the public sector, these are things like setting up innovation labs, um, setting up open, uh, always open idea uh, challenges, uh, and things like that. Uh, open, da uh, open data portals uh, are also an example of that. 
And in fact, when governments started to use social media as a channel to communicate with citizens, that was not as long ago as you might think. Um, that was really an adaptive thing. It was changing to the world around. So people had become used to interacting in a new way. And it took a while for governments to actually adapt it. And, and leadership was very you know, fearful of what that meant. They couldn't control the message anymore and the communications. It was, yeah. So that's an example of adaptive. And anticipatory is things like um, universal basic income experiments and uh, thinking about what rights, human rights, do bioengineered humans have. So these are things that are not here yet, uh, but it's things that we want governments to start thinking about. So on the top half of the line, the return on investment is much more clear. Uh, on the bottom, it's much less clear. Uh, in large organizations, government or otherwise, uh, a lot of the stuff below the line gets cut. <laughs> we don't know what value that's producing that doesn't fit with our evaluation criteria. We're wasting money. All those people look like they're having a good time, but what have they done? Um, so a lot of times uh, those projects kind of fall to the wayside or become marginalized. Um, the top is easier in large organizations really uh, easier in large organizations, below the line much harder in large organizations. Although, larger organizations tend to have more slack resources. Um, so it, there's the potential, but because that return on investment uh, is um, uh, difficult to show, those efforts often are not sustainable, sustained. Uh, the top half problems are more apparent to everybody. We know what we're solving for. People can see it, feel it, touch it. Uh, they feel the pain points. They know them. Um, they're apparent to everybody. They can be obvious problems or maybe complicated problems like climate change, but we kind of know at least the target. Uh, whereas below the line, the problems are less apparent. We don't even know what we, we didn't know, whether it's something about our customers' needs, um, or something structural about how our organization isn't fit for the future. Uh, for mission-oriented innovation, we've partnered up with uh, the University College of London Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, uh, and Mariana Mazzucato, who wrote a great book called The Entrepreneurial State. Has anybody read it? Nobody? Ooh, okay. It's really good. Put it on your book list. <laughs> uh, she talks about early stage uh, investments and the role that government plays in that. Because later on down the line, um, only, everybody's only investing in things that they know are going to produce known return on investment. There's a mission planning canvas. Take down the link. Look at it later. I want to go through the rest of this fast. But it's based on, this is like developing missions in government. Link, take a photo, people who want it. OK, moving on. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the anticipatory innovation governance work, um, the rights for bioengineered human stuff, but if you do want to... Oh, it's cut off. Okay, if you do want to... Uh, we're seeking advisors for that, so reach out if you're interested. We're looking beyond public sector uh, for that. Um, so we developed this workshop to uncover kind of nuanced understanding of what public sector uh, innovation entails, um, to use this model in practice as a sense-making tool, um, and to build capacity in the process, uh, to have those hard conversations. We also learned a lot about organizations before working with them in depth. <laughs> so this is a kind of test project. Things like trainings and workshops are easy to say yes to. I'm not going to go into how it relates to the stack, because I know we're, a bit, we're running a bit short on time. Um, so, what we, um, what we wanted to do with this workshop was to make it not so abstract and up in the, like, up in the abstract sphere, as I would say, that it doesn't make sense to anybody on the ground that's, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, not in their own language. And so, uh, we, uh, and we, meaning myself and uh, folks from uh, EDA, uh, decided to start with projects and activities that people uh, knew of, knew, uh, were, uh, could relate to. 
whether they were their own projects or projects that they would recognize, and map them to the facets as a canvas. So I want you to, um, I'll just go through these because I don't know if we have time to do the exercise. Uh, so this is an example, business licensing automation implementation. Following business process optimization analysis, the regulatory affairs department will implement additional digital process automation projects to reduce the internal license processing time to 30 minutes on average. So this is an example. What do you think? Where? This here? Okay. Yeah, exactly. Green New Deal. Comprehensive policy and investment package will direct energy investments into green alternatives and create incentives for research and development in the energy sector to reach the goal of being carbon neutral within 15 years. You want to shout it out where? Top. Oop. Mission. Yep. Uh, uh, CIO Council uh, on Artificial Intelligence Machine Learning, explore possibilities to leverage artificial intelligence for automated help desk applications, identify tools and methods for triaging service requests and inquiries, and explore the possibility of using AI to manage first, uh, first level, first tier help desk tickets. Oh, sorry, here? Here? Ah, this one's tough. So the mechanism or the tech is very anticipatory, right? It's, we're talking about it often in an anticipatory way. But the way that this is written, this is very enhancement oriented. So it's digitized in an existing process. OK, it's using AI, but AI doesn't have a purpose per public sector innovation is being used in this way for enhancement. So these are the kinds of conversations that we wanted public sector um, staff to have. Those questions about, um, I won't talk uh, in depth about it, but we wanted them to have those, these uh, conversations of, um, it depends. <laughs> Because that's the part that's really valuable in doing internal sense making. Um, so we wanted to gradually introduce new language, start with things participants do not personally care about. So at first we started with projects that were not their projects, but they could recognize them because they were governmenty. They're like, oh, I know what business pro business licensing is. I know what you know help desk tickets are. You know, even kind of the senior leadership, which is often the people we're doing this with, knew what that was. Um, and we let dis uh, participants discover and socialize the issues on their own. So for instance, we made their, they made their own portfolio of their own projects eventually, and then they had to tell themselves, is that what we want? And that's a really uncomfortable conversation among a lot of them, but they, they came to that conclusion themselves instead of us, you know, the consultants coming in and saying, you're all doing it wrong, uh, because we know how well that goes over. Uh, and we're dealing with people who don't have a lot of extra time. Uh, and we developed it into a game because these people don't get to do anything fun other than that. So we reverse engineered these portfolios and then we asked the question, is that what you want? Because you have an innovation portfolio whether it's intentional or not. So then we talked about better, what is a better portfolio look like, and that's suited for purpose, suited for those values we talked about. So I'll talk briefly about the components um, of, the, of the workshop and the game. So we had different patterns of action. I know these are not as well researched and rigorous as the ones we heard about this morning. Um, <laughs> but there are two kinds. So for activities or kind of structures in the organization, uh, do you want to amplify them? and or do you want to transition them to a different facet? So each card, and there are many for each uh, tr you know, transition, has a uh, action um, and then something kind of specific, but they had to make sense for uh, what that meant in their own organization. So this is a prompt, and then they had to discuss, well, what does that look like? What, do we, what would we have to do? What would we have to shift? And to help with that, we gave them these asset chips, which are actually little like poker chips. 
which has made it very game-like. Uh, and this is, of course, not an all-inclusive uh, list of things that can be modified, as I've been learning from your talks. Um, but they were uh, starters for conversations. So what would we have to do? What could we tweak? What could we put in there, take out, to make that happen? And really, that's building the capacity of uh, these uh, participants to do this kind of work and to think about portfolios and changing them, and that everything is designed and it's up to them to change how it looks in the future. Uh, we also stress tested. We did um, some uh, portfolio checks, so those really, really critical questions about, is this what you want? Is this really what you want? Is this what your mandate is? Uh, and then we threw in wildcard uh, shocks. So these are things that are in the realm of plausible for a lot of governments. Um, and for some governments that I won't mention who, um, they, they, they dealt with those as projects. <laughs> so modified the workshop a bit after that uh, for that kind of context. Uh, so here's kind of those key portfolio questions. What led to the current portfolio? Is someone stewarding that portfolio? That's a really key question. Um, are there strategies to support each facet? Uh, is the current balance indicative of a temporary or long-term trend? Uh, is the balance of the portfolio supportive of your overall purpose or purposes? Which public values are supported? That was a tough one. Um, so there's actually a physical prototype, and the reason why the, I mentioned sit close to the front is there are a couple that you can take away, and literally after I'm done talking, it's the fastest people who get here. So the people in the front um, are best suited. Not to say, like, you will win, but some fast people in the back, I see you. Uh, so there are some that come with the chips, two that come with the chips, two that I just have the card deck, so you can kind of look through it. And I want your feedback on this, too, so please email me, tweet at me. Let me know if I'm wrong, um, because we're constantly iterating this thing. Uh, we tested this workshop in Sweden with uh, Vinova, which is an internal innovation agency, uh, with deputy secretary generals of Estonia uh, in Middle East and North African countries, Montenegro. Uh, we, I won't talk about how we shifted that. Um, we just tested it last week with uh, Asian Pacific National Statistics Offices, so si 16 different NSOs. Uh, and then Norway is coming up in uh, October. So these resources are also available to download um, if you're not fast enough or didn't put on your running shoes um, today. Uh, and there are canvases as well that you'll need to download and print. Someone convinced me over lunch to start up a Kickstarter um, to make like the second version of this and actually make it into a game. Um, and so I did. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> the bad news is that it's still being reviewed, so it's not live yet. Um, but if you follow me on Twitter, I will let you know when it is. Um, and I'm not, I'm not wanting to make money on any of this. In fact, I can't. Um, so. Um, if you're interested in a, like a full game, uh, let me know, or follow, follow on Twitter, I'll let you know. Uh, so lessons. Um, one of the main ones here is that we need more support and time around the questions of, between these questions. What an organization can versus could do. So can is, what is your current capability? Could is, what could you do with different resources, authorities, know-how? How would you re reorganize that? Um, and the should is, uh, who, do you have the responsibility to do those things? Oftentimes, this, is, this comes from political will, public interest, ethical and moral interests. Um, so the, this is a question that we're still trying to deal with uh, and develop um, conversation guides around. I won't get into that, that's important. Um, there are certain methods that support uh, the different facets in, I would say they're biased maybe toward these different facets. Uh, and I won't go into these individually, uh, but maybe you know, take a look and I'll figure out how to get the slides later. Um, but if you're investing in these methods and these processes, um, really heavily, you might be biasing your innovation toward um, one facet of innovation over the other. 
A uh, free resource is the Toolkit Navigator. So it has 200 plus innovation toolkits um, organized by topic or discipline, but also organized by innovation tasks or jobs to be done. So problem solving jobs, group behavioral jobs, uh, approach planning jobs, and contextualization jobs. These are the ones that are most important to public sector innovators, but also probably important to the work that you do. Uh, I won't go into the individual ones, but these are the kinds of jobs. So it's not organized like a traditional, um, uh, yeah, I won't, I won't get into that. It's cool, go visit it. Um, the best way to build uh, innovation capability is to build the toolkit yourself. This is a great quote that I love. Um, so don't, out, don't outsource your capability building by bringing in someone else's toolkit. Make it your own or hack one that's free. And that's why we uh, also provide only toolkits that are available in um, editable formats or free and or free. If you have one, uh, if you want to explore Toolkit Navigator, take a look at the links. If you want to add a toolkit, um, you can do that via that link. And I'm getting about to get the hook here. Um, so I'm going to wrap up and uh, apologize that I went through a lot of that really fast. I apologize. No, I don't apologize for my irreverence. Um, <laughs> and that's all I have for now. OK. Thank you, Angela. I know you're, you, uh, you need to catch a flight, so that's why I was like pushing you off stage. <laughs> yeah, I felt it. I felt it. Uh, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, thank you for your, for your talk. And uh, we'll, we're going to have to uh, save our Q&A for another time. Uh, and uh, go into this kind of strange and way too big task that I've taken upon myself now to try to summarize these two insanely packed days. So before I do that, please give Angela, who, by the way, is uh, Intersection 19's champion of rock, scissor, paper, a big round of applause. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah.